In 2015, Marlon James won the coveted Man Booker Award for his novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings. He's back with a striking and fantastic epic, the first of a projected trilogy that draws on African history and mythology. It's called Black Leopard, Red Wolf, and it brings Marlene James back to her studio tonight. Hi. Hi, how are it's you doing? It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Kind of geeking out. <laughs> <laughs> kind of nerding out that you're sitting right here. Uh -huh. um, your uh, A Brief History of ki uh, Seven Killings was based on true events, mm -hmm. uh, but this book is based in a mythical world. Right. Uh, why did you tell this story through a fantastical lens? I think I was always inching towards towards telling, for me it's not a mythical story so much as a reclaiming myths. Mm -hmm. Because um, it's one thing when you grow up taking them for granted, it's another, another thing when you don't have them. And for me, it, it just always felt for me that I was going to end up here sooner or later. I made this analogy that if you make rock and roll sooner or later you have to get to the blues. Yeah. And, and I think if I'm going to continue writing fiction, particularly anything fantastical, mm -hmm. I had to go back to histories and imagine histories that I didn't have. Is that where you feel most comfortable? Um, initially, no, because I'm still a Western person. I grew up with Western myths and I grew up with, with Christianity and, and so on. So it was, it was as much an education, an education for me as it would have been for, I guess, anybody else. But um, yeah, I just it, to me it feels like a, like um, an inevitable direction, so much as a change of focus. And you did a short story a uh, long, long time ago, and it was based in a mystical in a mytholo uh, mythical world, wasn't it? I'm trying to remember which one that was. I always have a, ba a bad memory of my short stories. <laughs> I probably did that to try it on, mm -hmm. sort of try it on for size, but not really delving really deep. Whereas with this book, I wanted to almost get lost in it. And did you get lost in it? I got totally lost in it. I got lost several times, and and I hope that loss, that that adriftness comes over to the reader, because I think it should. You should be sort of overwhelmed a little bit. I mean, the current will come back for you, but there's nothing wrong with it, you know, paddling and and you know, sort of being a little adrift for a little bit. When you say overwhelmed, what do you mm. mean by the content or the characters? But or? everything, because one of the things about I found during the research is how complex and multi-layered these stories were and how, if it's an African folktale, chances are the trickster is telling it. Mm -hmm. So you still have to view it like this may be an unreliable narrator. And it just struck me how there was a time when the listener had to do all this work with a story that we, the readers, don't want to do anymore. So people say it's challenging or it's difficult or it's confused. I'm like, yeah, but there are people who before only listen to stories and they had to just snap into it and figure it out and do some detective work and so on. And I, and I really wanted to get back to that. It's very important to me that it feels like it could be read aloud. Well, I mean, let's talk about the book for mm -hmm. a second. Uh, the story is told from the perspective of a character named Tracker, mm -hmm. um, who has a famous nose. Uh, yeah. What motivates Tracker? Uh, man, what motivates Tracker? He doesn't know. He moves from town to town and city to city and bed to bed, and he doesn't really, he doesn't really know. It kind of blindsides him when he comes across the things that are really important and, and that he needs it. And even when he's surrounded by things he never knew he wanted, he's still kind of the grumpy one in the family. He's very funny, too. Yeah, he was a lot of fun to write. Yeah. He, um, like most of my characters, start out in the margins, and then they kind of announce themselves and will not be denied. And next thing I know, the novel is about them. Well, it's kind of good that Tracker can, you know, has the skills to protect himself because he's mm. got a feisty mouth, right? He really, yeah. My mouth's gotten me into trouble too. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> well, Tracker uh, goes on a quest, and mm -hmm. uh, he's joined by a shape-shifting um, individual uh, called Leopard. Mm -hmm. um, any significance behind creating a character that changes forms? Lots of significance. One, I was very fascinated at all the the where the W E R E creatures I came across were cats. Mm -hmm. Because here they're pretty much canine, they're werewolves and so on. Where there it's we're cheetah and we're lion and we're we're leopards. But the the shape shifter is also such a crucial part of African storytelling and African mythology. Um, even Anansi's both spider mm -hmm. and man, and that that whole idea of of identities shifting plays in so well when we start to talk about orientations shifting or bodies transforming. That all these things that we that are such hot button issues now are things that the African stories resolved thousands of years ago. Even the language, like the pronouns. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, they resolved that years ago. I was pointing out to an audience last night, said to the Jamaicans, like, have you ever noticed we never needed we never needed help to to use them? Mm, them. Cause we always thought that we thought that way anyway. We call single people them. Mm -hmm. So you know, my students think I'm so progressive. I'm like, no, nah, is this a Jamaican accent? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit of a nerd, so when mm -hmm. I read uh, a book, I usually go to the acknowledgments uh, mm -hmm. just to see what. Uh, the writer is thinking what's important to them. Mm -hmm. uh, in your acknowledgments, you actually write that my mother is allowed to read yes. all but two pages of this <laughs> book. Uh, why is that? And what are those two pages? So, so there is a running in all my books. There's a running. There's sort of a running gag in all that acknowledgments about what my mother is allowed to read. <laughs> um, the first one said to my mother, "Who should not be allowed to read this book?" So now she can read Eric too. But I think there's some really intimate goings on. So my mom is a very devout church lady. So that might be too much. And the goings on are between men. Mm -hmm. And what struck me reading this book, it was very casual about it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, you know, out of the ordinary. Yeah, but you know, the the this you know, Africa has this an African continent, not African continent, some countries in the continent have this reputation for homophobia, which I thought was really interesting. Um, because nobody talks about the role in which the evangelical church, American evangelical church plays into that. That uh, from the research, the research I found, things like like queerness, gayness, and so on was stuff that was already accepted and absorbed into all these various African societies from before, which was very shocking and, and affirming to hear. Um, what did it mean to you to find that out as a gay man? Well, it meant it meant that um, far from what I have been told, that it's sort of an aberration or even something that we some disease we got infected with by Europeans, that, you know, queerness, otherness, transness has always been part of, of you know, so many, so much of the African framework. Um, you know, the, the, when we talk about warriors who were, the warriors who were trusted with brides to be because everybody knew they were gay, so nothing was gonna happen. Um, that society is, and it's not to say that, you know, that society is, were like wholly accepted queerness and so on, but they realized the role um, those people played. And um, for me to, to realize that to go, I didn't expect to be go. I didn't expect to go to the past to find validation. I thought I'd in the present and hope for the future. Maybe we'll be less homophobic. Blah 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 blah. But to find out that we actually were less before. So it's affirming. It's affirming. What I found interesting though was, with that being said, there is still homophobia. Um, mm -hmm. There are still people in the book who um, are excommunicated from their families because mm -hmm. they're gay. Yeah. Um, why have that if this is a world mm -hmm. that you're imagining and creating? Mm -hmm. Why because, still have homophobia? Well, because hate is old too, and and prejudice is old too. And I didn't want to. I, I mean, I didn't want to go make a, an error in either way, saying everything was all everything was fantastic. But what I think wasn't there is this sort of state side or religion side legit um, endorsement of hate. But religion does come up a little bit. The, mm -hmm. uh, the characters have this thing where they say, F the gods. Uh -huh. And it goes through, um, you know, the book. When mm -hmm. you're writing something, is this, is this something that you're struggling with too? So in a way, sometimes. I think um, when, um, the thing that Tracker probably says is most like me is when he says, I don't believe in belief. Which that is what I'm struggling. I think I struggle with not necessarily religion, but the need for it. What does that mean? I don't believe in. Belief. I don't believe in belief. Um, that to have belief as a system, to have faith as a system, as opposed to knowledge or certainty or so on. Um, you know, to to put trust in other things and in institutions at the expense of your own intelligence or common sense. And I'm not. I'm not saying these are bad things, but I'm saying that. I am in a, I personally know I'm in a, in a sort of a permanent limbo with all of that. I don't think I'd ever call myself an atheist. I'm way too cowardly for that. <laughs> but what would that mean coming from a family, uh, having a mother who is a devout believer? But she also became a devout believer later in her years. Um, you know, I don't know if she was questioning before, but I also came out of that. I came out of church and I went to church. I joined church pretty late. I joined church in my late twenties. But did you join church because you were trying to run away from who you knew to oh, yourself absolutely. to be? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I ended up finding more than that in church. I actually mm -hmm. did find community. And, um, and there are things about church which I think people you know, need to recognize that a lot of, in a lot of communities all over the world, church is the glue that holds it together. Um, but 
I, you know, I had bigger questions, and especially in a church that was very unintellectual. So the whole idea of questions is just anathema to it. And, um, and I'm just not, I'm not crazy about dogma, and I'm not crazy about anti-intellectualism. You want to ask questions? I want to ask questions. They don't have to be answered, but I think we should at least consider them. Well, I want to read a passage from, uh, it's weird to read your words when you're <laughs> sitting beside me, but this is uh, in the voice of uh, Tracker. Um, the spirit in the upper branches of this tree was my father talking to me, telling me to kill for my own brother, and the village knew. They came to my uncle's house to ask. The old woman sent word with the children, when will you avenge your brother? The other boys asked me as they taught me to fish, when will you avenge your brother? Each time someone asked the question, the question had new life. After years of wanting to be nothing like my father, I now wanted to be him, except he was my grandfather. I wanted to be like my grandfather. My grandmother had gone mad from her need for revenge. Why is vengeance a major theme in this book? Um, well, one was some of the research I was doing in Omo Valley and how a lot of the, quite a few of the tribes there are still very much embroiled in blood feuds. Um, and, and, and how much, how that clashes with with so many um, men, particularly in, in these villages, want to sort of move on, they want to embrace the 21st century, um, but they'll get a call or a message or a letter. Um, you know, your brother was killed by such and such, he need to be, it needs to be avenged. And that struck me that we're, that the idea of vengeance hasn't yet evol evolved into justice. And that, that was something that fascinated me. It's something I still think about, and I, you know, and I, I and I run into it, um, reading history of everywhere, right, of history of America, or even in in Jamaica, that there is still, there is still this thing where vengeance and justice are still considered linked. And I wanted to, I wanted to explore that, and I also wanted to, to see where that goes. Um, ultimately, it really doesn't go anywhere. Um, that sounds kind of, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> yeah, well, deflating. Well, yeah, I mean, a mission of vengeance, there's also another thing that I think Dracker says near the end that all he can see is waste. Mm. That all the, 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 the potential, all the lives, all the, the, the beauty that we are know, we, we, we've lost because of this. And says, so, yeah, and right now all I see is waste. Well, at one point, Leopard says to Tracker, love or revenge, mm. you cannot have both. Mm -hmm. um, and the French share this motto, which is nobody loves no one, and mm -hmm. it appears throughout the book. Uh, if that, that was is... actually from Chris Isaac, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> if that is the case, uh, what would the motivation for any relationship be? I think the motivation for any relationship would be to defy all that that um, to an extent, a love relationship makes no sense. And that's exactly what's so great about them. Um, they're not rational, and that's what's great about them, that, that um, when it works, it defies everything that is wrong in the world. And, um, and I think that's important, and I think that's something that Tracker himself accidentally falls into and realizes the meaning of that. Maybe too late, but he does. But I do think that, that um, some of the, 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 the most powerful and wonderful things in this world make no sense. Um, you, know, you, can't th you know, you can't think yourself into love. I've tried, it doesn't work. <laughs> Same. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're running out of time and I have a few more questions to ask you about mythology. Mm -hmm. um, you've said that the ancient Greeks are the only ones who got human nature uh, right. Right. Uh, what did you mean by that? Meaning that they can still, they can still deal with the complexity of really, really terrible people. I think for us, the the more horrendous the crime is, the quicker we have. This is the, the more urgent for us to reduce the person. We 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 can't humanize our monsters, and sometimes for valid valid reasons. But I think the ancient Greeks were very good at at keeping that complexity, especially moral complexity when characters have done terrible things. I don't know, in the absence of Greek mythology, I can't imagine Medea existing as a play, um, or the Oresteia. And I think that they also put their heroes in check in ways in which we still can't. Um, you know, we're, we, we, we're going through, every, every day there's another hero who we have found have done horrible things. And, um, we go through our own crisis because we don't know how to process the heroism, the acts of the hero, or whatever they've done or accomplished or made with who they are. 
Which, whereas I think the ancient Greeks figured that out really, really well. Everyone's complex. Everyone's complex, and ultimately your talent isn't yours anyway. Who's is it then? I don't know. The, well, for them, the gods. So, <laughs> which brings us right back to religion. Uh, what draws you to mythology? Um, the stories, the paganism, mm -hmm. the um, funny enough, the feminism, and the 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 the, 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 the most of the myths. Quite a few of the myths are really quite very gender equal and very, um, you know, they have been retold in all sorts of ways. So they're almost all of them have been corrupted in one way or another. But it's just such a sensual, sensory, for the most part, equal and equally dangerous world where anything is possible. Well, you are, you describe this book as an African Game of Thrones, and mm. I'm wondering if now you regret saying that? <laughs> Do you regret saying that, or is, is that I an I don't regret saying it, although I think it's hilarious that it, it, it took off so, it took off so much that George R. R. Martin emailed me. And said what? And said he heard I'm writing an African version of his book. You thought it was delightful. <laughs> well, the, 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 the statement, I don't think he's read the book. Um, I, you know, if it's, if, if, it serves a purpose of promising and in some cases warning people that even though it's a world of make-believe, it's a very adult book, which is what I think Game of Thrones is, then um, I'm fine with it. Uh, in a talk you gave at Pembroke College in the UK, you said that any reader of Marvel comics and fantasy uh, knows how, to, how it feels to feel insignificant. Mm -hmm. um, when have you felt insignificant? Um, growing up, growing up as a, growing up in the suburbs, growing up as a nerd, sissy, growing up in, in all sorts of environments where people make it a job to reduce you, um, and turning to stuff like comics, particularly comics like X Men, which is also a bunch of rejects. Um, I always say reading X Men is a lot like being an X Man, and and I still believe it. Um, that the, you know that then you find community in a fellow outcast which is what I found as well from high school um, coming up. But yeah, but also writing is a lonely profession and writing is sometimes in isolation, certainly when I was growing up and, and, and doing it. Um, so yeah, I think um, being who I was growing up and being a writer, I'm on, on my own quite a bit. And I think to get to the point where I moved from thinking I'm isolated to just being alone. Mm -hmm. Took, that, was, that itself was a process. Well, you're not alone anymore. And <laughs> <laughs> when you moved to uh, the, uh, the US, you had like a couple hundred dollars on you. Mm. Um, seven Killings, uh, I was really successful. Uh, Black Leopard, Red Wolf, everybody's reading it. Mm -hmm. um, in writing this book, what did you learn about yourself and about the world? And do you still feel insignificant? Um, man, I hope I do. Not insignificant, but small. And I think it's a big world and I should feel small in it small in it. There's more to the world than me, and there's certainly more to the world than, than this book. Um, what did I learn? It goes back to what I said before, that people like me have always belonged. And I think that's what I learned. Because right now, people like me, whether it's race or orientation, someone are struggling for a place. We're struggling for a seat at the table. And to find out that we probably even made the table um, is really, really powerful. So that's what I learned. And commercial success is important, right? That too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Marlon James, it's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much and congratulations. It's a great book. Thank you so much. Thanks. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.